Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. focus in on just a few of the verses here, um, beginning in verse 9. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 9. Now you're starting to get used to where Ecclesiastes is, right? After Psalms and Proverbs. And Psalms right in the middle there, and you got Proverbs right after that's Ecclesiastes. You get into Song of Solomon, oh my goodness, you're in trouble. More ways than one. But... <laughs> So turn back, turn back. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. In verse 9 we read, Two are better than one, because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. You know, I like great poetry. Um, th that last hymn that we just sang is one that's filled with deep meaning and great poetry, if you think about it. Sometimes we sing them so often we lose the meaning, but it says, Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. It's profound, it's beautiful, and good for us to think on and to sing about another poem that I like, although not so profound. To dwell above with saints we love, that will be grace and glory. But to live below with the saints we know, well, that's another story. Okay, well, maybe not great poetry. <laughs> but is it not true? <laughs> we have these wonderful thoughts about the women are going to be studying about heaven and, and all that that entails. And that's a wonderful study for us to undertake. To realize the beautiful, the wonderful future that we have ahead of us, and we always look at it, and we think, "Oh, it's going to be so good to be with all the saints and all the other believers in heaven, and be grand and glorious and beautiful." And then I realize, "No, it's with you guys, <laughs> just to have ordinary people." And hopefully, glorification might help a little bit. Uh, nonetheless, it's every ordinary people, and that's what the body of Christ is. is it's just average, ordinary people that are in process, and, and none of us has quite arrived yet, and so uh, we are a little prickly sometimes, and sometimes we're hard to get along with, and sometimes we say things that we later regret and that the other person regrets immediately. We, we do a lot of silly things that we ought not to do, but yet we need each other. We need each other especially when life is absurd. You know, we've been looking this last couple weeks at, at this book of Ecclesiastes, and he, he keeps telling us that life is it's meaningless, it's futile. He uses the word chabel in, in the Hebrew, which basically means absurd. Life is just absurd. And when you think about it, is it not? All the things that we go through in life that make absolutely no sense to us whatsoever, all those curveballs that life throws at us, and we're thinking, what was with that? And why am I going through this? And we're filled with questions and concerns and anxieties and worries and doubts and fears. What do we do with those things? Well, Ecclesiastes is a good book for that. It's a place where we turn where a man is wrestling with the meaning and purposelessness he senses of the cycles of life and the seasons of life and the things that happen to us in life. And he, he, he doesn't even understand what God is doing. He says, God, you've placed eternity in my heart, but I, I just can't figure out what you're doing. I don't get it. It's too much for me. So what does he do? He's bluntly honest with God, and he pours out his heart to God, and he says, I make the best of every day at carpe diem, 
you know, make the best of this life, of my work and my play and every other aspect of life. I make the best of it. It's a gift from God, and I just continue to do it, and I seek to please Him. That's the glimpse of hope we find in the midst of Ecclesiastes, that maybe there is some meaning in life, and it's found in, in, in pleasing God. But yet life is absurd. It's hard to figure out. Things happen to people. My dad right now facing cancer. That's a, that's a tough thing to face. Um, he's doing well. He's you know, pressing forward. His doctor's encouraged. But it's a tough battle. And often we experience these battles. Others experience relational problems. And that can be a real battle that catches us off guard. And, and other people, it's other physical maladies or it's things that happen. Sometimes we're driving along in the car and there's another driver who's not so good who bangs into us. I mean, there, there are things that happen. There are tragedies of life that there's not much we can do about. But keep pressing ahead. Press on. And I think what he's getting at in this text is don't just keep pressing ahead. <laughs> Embrace those around you and press ahead together. When life gets absurd, we need each other especially. And there's a strange tendency that we have, that when things get tough, that some of us like to isolate ourselves. We like to run away from our friends and our fellowship group or a small group of people that we're closest to, or our church. Oh, I don't know how many people get disappointed with life and get disappointed with God. What do they do? They stop going to church. It's the last thing you want to do if you're going through difficult times. You need these people. You need them to come around you and to encourage you and lift you up. And, and I know sometimes they're prickly. I know sometimes they say things they shouldn't say, but they're still your brothers and sisters. And they really do, deep down, love you. And they really want your best. Well, most of them, anyway. You know? <laughs> so the absurdity of life causes many to pull away from others. When we're, we're hurt, we run away. At the very moment, we should be running into the arms of those closest to us. In America, we talk about being rugged individualists. You know, we pull up the bootstraps and we, we do it ourselves. And we try a little harder and we'll get through it. But it just doesn't work very well when life is absurd, when things start happening to us. Rugged individualism just only gets you so far. In a day of social media, we have little time for deep friendship. You don't have time to spend with each other. We broadcast to others what's going on in our life. Here's what I ate for breakfast. <laughs> As if I care. <laughs> but deep communication... You know, where we're really sharing what's going on in our lives and our hearts and where we're vulnerable and honest about it and, and where we don't just put on a good face for everybody to make it look like everything's good. It doesn't happen very often. Honesty. Accountability. There seems to be a pervasive loneliness in our world, especially when we go through the hard times. Go visit somebody in a hospital or nursing home, retirement community. A lot of loneliness, a lot of lonely people. There are a lot of cabins up here, people. Just lonely as can be. And that, too, is absurd. Albert Einstein said this, It's strange to be known so universally, and yet to be so lonely. You know, you can be famous, and still be a completely lonely individual. Unfortunately, there are too many Lone Ranger Christians. <laughs> but do you notice in this picture that the Lone Ranger is not so lonely? He's got Tonto. And he's got his horse. Cord of three strands and not easily be broken. <laughs> the Lone Ranger isn't as alone as he thinks he is, is he? But there's a lot of Lone Ranger Christians. They think, well, you know, I'm going to be okay. I don't need other people in the body of Christ. I don't need to have fellowship times. I don't need to get to know people on a deep level. I don't need, to, I don't even, I don't need church. They don't like, I only get hurt when I go to church. Well, there's a foolishness in being a Lone Ranger when it comes to 
our life as Christians. In Proverbs, it says this, that whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. We don't want to isolate ourselves. There's, it's a foolishness. And the Bible suggests to us that, that we need each other, and we need to be there for each other. And, and the one who thinks that they stand strong by themselves will take heed lest you fall. Galatians 6, 1 tells us if anyone's caught in a transgression, you are spiritual to restore him in a spirit of boldness, a spirit of gentleness, and keep watch on yourselves, lest you too be tempted. Bear with one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. The foolishness of Lone Ranger Christianity, thinking I can just get by with myself, I don't need church, I don't need a small group of people around me, I don't need to develop deep friendships, is this, that you are standing there all by yourself. Oh, take heed, lest when things get tough, you fall. Because that's when it's going to happen, when you're most vulnerable, when you're going through the tough things, when the seasons of life that we talked about last week come into our life, the things that you can do nothing about, you didn't invite them, you didn't ask for them, but there they are. And there's a lot of them when you get older. <laughs> it's true. Those seasons are tough sometimes. Oh, do we need each other? What we need are companions on the journey, especially when life seems absurd. That's when we especially need friends for the journey. I think that's where he's getting at here. He says, he gives us three basic illustrations of this. He says, two are better than one, in verse 9, because they have a good return on their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Two of us are better than one. We'll do better. There will be a better reward to whatever we're doing. This is, this is pretty much true of life. I mean, I know that there are, are cases where two of you are probably not better than one. <laughs> I run into that one. I remember when I was in, in school growing up, I, I took physics. And when I remember taking physics, I had a horrible lab partner. And um, it didn't matter what I did. Somehow, he would always manage to tip something over or move it where it wasn't supposed to be or not follow the directions or something. But we never got any of those projects right. They were always way off. And thankfully, our teacher allowed what we called the universal fudge factor so that we could get the results to where we wanted them to with the multiplication of the UFF, which was beautiful and wonderful. But it was still kind of frustrating at times. It's like, I think I would do better if I was doing it myself. But then I took chemistry, and I had a different lab partner. And it was like a world of difference. We got the best results every time. I thought, what was the difference? Well, we're working together and we made a good team. But there is, even though we sometimes think we're better by ourselves, that somebody's going to pull us down, ultimately, especially when we're going through the difficult times of life, we need each other. There are going to be times where you're going to fall down and you need somebody to pull you back up. And if you're out there all by yourself, what are you going to do? Ever go for a walk in the woods all by yourself? Some of us like to do that. It's a bad thing to do when you have bad ankles like I do. You need to step in something and oh, oh, here's a mile and a half walk back on a bad ankle. That's going to be fun. Um, sometimes we, we think we're okay by ourselves, but it's not always, in fact, it's not a good thing. Um, a few points about this text. In general, we accomplish more working together. This is true in the body of Christ, too. Sometimes I think, I don't need to delegate anything. I don't need anybody to help me. I can do this better myself. No. You will do better in the long run if you have people helping you with it and learning from you and you're delegating things and you're passing things on so that you can do other things and allow somebody else to take care of that thing. You see, there's all kinds of ways that this can be. If you're out going and trying to share your faith with other people, you will be better if there's two of you than if you're by yourself. You'll be bolder about it. Remember when Jesus sent the disciples? We just studied that in the men's Bible studies yesterday. 
Jesus says, go two by two. Take nothing for your journey. You know, take your sandals and one shirt. And head out on off and trust God for the rest. But he says, go two by two. Don't go by yourself. He doesn't say, go by yourself. No, we need each other. And we're better together. When we use our different gifts and our different abilities, our different experiences and backgrounds, when you pray together, there's something powerful about praying for something by yourself. But there's something about two or three gathering that is extremely powerful in prayer. So continue to you know, recognize the validity of these principles. In general, there's more benefit or reward when we work together. We all have times when life really proves observed and we fall down, and that's when we really need each other. And it's a sad thing to have to face life's absurdity, the trials and struggles, all alone. You're not made for that. None of us is. Pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Second illustration. If two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? In the cold part of the season when people were traveling, what would they do? They would get close to each other to get some body heat to keep themselves warm. I got a couple people in an igloo here. I just was in Minnesota not too long ago. It was like 20 below one day. You know, when it gets cold, when it gets really cold, you want closeness. When it's hot, don't touch me. But when it's cold, you want as much warmth as you can possibly get. How can one keep warm alone? You can't. It requires. You ever tried to start a fire with one piece of wood? There's enough people here that do firewood that know that's a really dumb idea. It just doesn't work. But you get them in close proximity with each other, and you place them correctly, and, and you start out small and you know, build on it. But there's certain principles. One of the principles is fire doesn't take place unless you've got a couple logs that are in close proximity to one another. And fellowship and friendship is the same way. You, you don't burn bright as a Christian by yourself. You don't. You need other people in close proximity with you to help you walk the path. Together, we need each other. And when we are burning, and the one guy is going through the good stuff right now, and another person is encouraged through things that they're going through, and they've just seen God answer prayer, and I'm down and discouraged, guess what happens? It, I might feel like I'm wet wood, but guess what? They're on fire, and they're going to pass that on to me, and eventually I'm going to get it. The, what, this is the principle of the body of Christ. We need each other. And we all have times where we especially need other people. Especially when life gets crazy. And I'm tempted to isolate myself. I'm tempted to quit. I'm tempted to go the other direction. No, that's when you need to run to the arms of those around you. Chuck Swindoll. One of his books writes about the ye old porcupine syndrome. I like this. It says, Christian groups are often like a pack of porcupines on a frigid, wintry night. The cold drives us together in a tight huddle to keep warm. And as we begin to snuggle really close, our sharp quills cause us to jab and prick each other, a condition which forces us apart. But before long, we start getting cold. So we move back to warm again, only to stab and puncture each other once more. He says, how can we break ye old porcupine syndrome? The answer in one word is involvement. Or to use the biblical term, it is fellowship. Fellowship. Yes, we're prickly sometimes, aren't we? We have idiosyncrasies. Some of us talk too much and some talk too little. Some of us are just so bluntly honest and say things that maybe, well, maybe that was a little too honest. Uh, Sometimes we, we gossip or, you know, we, we say something that wounds. Words can really hurt, you know. They say that names don't hurt us, but 
It, words really can. We are like porcupines sometimes. But we need each other. We need each other. You can't keep warm by yourself. So says Colbert. Third illustration is this one. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. And a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. You're in a tough part of the city where you shouldn't probably be by yourself. Not wise. Now, I don't know about Arnold, what that would mean, but if you go down the hill a little bit to find one of our cities, I guarantee you I find some neighborhoods that you probably don't want to walk around in by yourself. But with somebody else, especially in a group, there's some safety in numbers. And such is the wisdom of Cole out here. When he says that there's safety, you can, uh, the other one can defend you. The other one is there for you. The other one is there to protect you. So it is in fellowship. We're protecting each other. And then he says, a cord of three strands is not easily broken. Now, this is a proverb that's found not just in Hebrew, but in Samaria and a number of the other countries around there. And it basically means this. There is strength in numbers. It's not just two, but three or more is even stronger in many cases. And so we need each other. We need close friends that will come alongside of us. But we need a group of people around us oftentimes. That will be the strength that will take us through the times of, 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 of absurdity. There you go. Hard to say. So a few points. When we face danger, we're better off with a faithful companion. Or better yet, being part of a group. And when life gets especially absurd and there is a struggle for your faith, it's best to find good companions to help you in the struggle. It's good to be part of a group that will help you fight for the faith, and will help you stand strong. You might think, oh, I'll be fine. Take heed. When you think you're strong, lest you fall. Swindoll again, friendships must be cultivated. They don't automatically occur when a calamity strikes. And I've never heard of a rent-a-friend business either. <laughs> you good? Rent-a-friend business, yeah. Uh -huh. You know, I thought I was doing along, I was going along just fine, and then I hit the hard spot. Well, let's see, one eight hundred rent a friend. Yeah, it doesn't work. Rentafriend.com or something. Like that. Hashtag. Well, who knows? In any case, it's not the way it works. Friendships require time and attention. They require proximity. They require us to be together, to get to know each other. They require small talk. <clears throat> and experiences together, as well as deep conversations, and honesty, and openness, and vulnerability. Friendships have to be cultivated, and they don't happen overnight. But oh, good friends are so valuable to us in the journey of life, especially when life gets absurd. Again, Chuck Swindoll, was, this is a little video thing. I don't usually Chuck, go with Chuck Swindoll every illustration, but he writes so well on friendship. He was talking to his friend, Jer Johnny Coons, and he said, Johnny said, to him, what is a real friendship? Wow. He says, here it is. Real friendships go deep. There will be love present, grace present, encouragement present, and accountability. I think that's a pretty good way of looking at it. Four characteristics of a deep friendship. Love. And again, in, in the Greek language, there's more than one word for love. Friendship, brotherly kindness, philos, is the, is the love of, of brotherly kindness. It's a partnership based on the experiences that we have together. It's what we share together that gives us a closeness, a partnership, a friendship. And you know, really good friends or couples or people that you know, you have a lot of experiences, common experiences together, a lot of common interests together. 
you share common stories together because you've gone through things together. And the common things are what draw us together and give us a bond. And in Christ, of course, we have a commonness because of our relationship with Christ that becomes a foundation for all of us to have something in common, at least. But the more we do life together, the more our friendships are developed. The more philos love is there for us, as well as agape love, which is, of course, that will the good of another person kind of love, that willingness to sacrifice everything for the sake of another individual. Um, the kind of love that Jesus showed when he died for us on the cross is the ultimate example of agape. But love is the foundation of good friendship and of fellowship. And they're grace-based. We treat each other better than what we deserve. We easily forgive and bear with each other when we really are deep friends. We seek to benefit the other person as much as we can. We're always seeking the best of that other individual, and we accept them. We accept each other as we are, not as we ought to be. We, we know each other's strengths and weaknesses. We may bug each other and irritate each other at times, but when push comes to shove, I accept you as you are, warts and all. That's grace. I take you as you are. I know you're not perfect, but I love you anyway. That's the way God took you. <laughs> he accepts you. Encouragement. No greater gift than a friend can bring and encouragement, especially when we're down. When life gets absurd, oh, how we need people to come and say something that's going to lift us up. Get our eyes off of our problems and get our eyes off of ourselves. And, oh, I have to have a pity party because things is... No, and a good encourager will come alongside of us and get our eyes off of that and onto the hope that we have. He'll be there. Often he'll come alongside and not just have a word for us, but a, a prayer. Someone who can really help us. Encourage us. And accountability. Iron sharpens iron, Scripture says. We sharpen each other. And a friend can be honest with you, even brutally honest with you, and hopefully has the tact to do it with gentleness. <laughs> but you may not appreciate it at the moment, but they are looking out for your best. They're seeking to restore you, hopefully gently, as the Scripture says. But good friends keep us on track. <clears throat> they do. They care enough about you to speak truth into your life especially when you're in a vulnerable place or where you're making wrong choices. <coughs> a good friend is able to speak into your life with love and gentleness. It may have a barb to it that you don't appreciate at the moment, but in the long run, you will appreciate it because they're doing it because they love you. And a good friendship has an accountability on both sides. They keep us on track. You see, there are a cord of three strands. Three are better than two. The point of the expression is that there's strength in numbers. And it raises the question, do you have a group of fellow companions on the journey? Or are you just a lone ranger? <coughs> Don't be a lone ranger. Find some good friends. Get to know them deeply. You know, not just the surface stuff. It starts there. It's okay to have surface conversations. But they have to move deeper than that. There has to be some accountability that's a part of it. Love each other, get to know each other, do things together, have fun together, but have deep conversations with each other. Open up, be honest with each other, be accountable to each other. Because we need it. We need each other. Lone Ranger Christianity, it's all around us. And it's dangerous out there all by yourself. Even Lone Ranger had time to and his horse. Good companions. What about you? Are you trying to do it all by yourself? Especially when life gets absurd. Oh, we need each other. Oh, how we need each other. Let's pray. Lord, I, I just pray for this congregation. There's a lot of friendships that are here. A lot of fellowship that's taken place over the years. Maybe some porcupine quills, too. Maybe we feel like we've gotten elbowed a few too many times by somebody who did something they shouldn't have done. 
But oh Lord, make the church, this church, a place of grace and of love and encouragement and accountability. Because that's what we need. And Lord, this community so needs it. There are hundreds or thousands of people who instead of pulling close, have given up. They're not a part of the church. They're not a part of a Christian fellowship. They are isolated and vulnerable. Oh, Lord, help us to be a place that reaches out to them and pulls them in and encourages them. And may this be a place where they can be comfortable and loved, even if they're prickly at times. Help us to love them and show grace to them. Lord, we need it. We need each other, and this community needs a place where people can come and just be loved and accepted and shown grace. So we open our hearts to that, I pray. Help us just to deepen in our friendships and our love for each other. Let our small groups grow, and um, may they become places of deep friendship and fellowship. And... Um, Continue to do the same in our kids and in our young people because they need each other too. Just keep doing it, Lord. And thank you for what you're going to do. Thank you for reminding us that when life gets absurd, two are better than one, and a cord of three strands cannot easily be broken. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why don't you join me? And we're going to sing a song um, that talks about. When life is a bit absurd, well, you're going to have to go up a few slides. I can't use it there. That gives me a chance to find the page. <laughs>